With mentorship and support, Ryan Blair emerged from a tough upbringing and years of gang membership to create several multi-million dollar companies. How did the entrepreneur rise above adversity? And what was it like to lose his first million? I'll ask Blair, the author of Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain, next on Metro Center Outlook. Hello everyone, welcome to Metro Center Outlook. I'm Diane Trees, director of the UCF Metro Center and your host for Metro Center Outlook. Trouble at home and poverty pushed Ryan Blair into gang life as a teen. But with support from a mentor and an education, he embarked on a path of entrepreneurship and now oversees Visalis, a weight loss platform that recently surpassed the $1 billion sales mark. Blair joins me today to talk about how he turned his street smarts into business savvy and to offer up some of the tips he includes in his book, Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Talk a little bit about your background, how you got to where you are today and, and some of the details in the book. Yeah, um, well my story is one where I started out in the middle class and then my father unfortunately got addicted to drugs and as a result of that my family was torn apart and we went from being in the middle class to being in poverty. And my, I'm the youngest of six, and so my brothers and sisters all got caught up making bad decisions. Pretty soon as a young 13-year-old, I started making bad decisions. Um, when I was about 13 years old, I got caught up with the wrong kids, got involved in a gang. Next thing you know, I'm in and out of juvenile hall, in and out of trouble. Uh, dropped out of high school my freshman year. By the time I was a, a senior in high school, by the time I was 18 years old, I really had no hope for the future whatsoever. My mom, uh, who was a single mother, she didn't want to lose me to prison like a lot of uh, the kids in my neighborhood were going to, or my brothers and sister for that matter. So she was really desperate to find me help. She introduced me to a mentor when I was about 17 years old, and he took an uh, interest in me and taught me the subject of entrepreneurship, which to me was a brand new concept, you know, something that was never taught in school. So it was a really a magical thing for me to learn how wealthy people uh, made such great livings. Well, you say in the book that entrepreneurship, not everybody is built for that. Yeah. How did you know that you had those attributes? And, and what do you mean? Yeah. That well, yeah, so during the, during the time, I didn't know I was destined to be a, a decent entrepreneur. Um, but I, looking back and reflecting, you know, entrepreneurship is about the ability to take risk. Uh, and the higher the risk, the greater the reward, as the expression goes. It's the ability to lead. It's the ability to be innovative, to be a dreamer. Um, to self-learn, uh, you know, and sometimes you have to abandon your traditional academic belief systems and learning in order to be a, an entrepreneur. So I had a lot of the right attributes as a result of the, pro, you know, the circumstances I was raised in, and so those attributes, lend, you know, lended themselves well. A lot of other people don't have those attributes, but they can reprogram them and they can overcome them. They just have to learn how to. It sounds like you were really fascinated with some of the aspects of the business angles and that as, as you were learning though. Yeah, well for me, um, I was always told because I was attention deficit, because I, I mean I was held back in the second grade for the first time. So I was always a learning disabled child. I was always having uh, struggles. Um, and so I was told I would never be a doctor or I'd never be a lawyer. So to me, the ultimate payback was that I could one day employ doctors and lawyers, right? So <laughs> that's, th that's true. <laughs> yeah, I, I, all the teachers that said, you know, you need to go to trade school. Well, now I employ people that didn't have to go to trade school. Now you say you went from middle class to poverty. And, and in your book, let me yeah. quote this, I didn't start at the bottom, but I reached it quickly. Yeah. How did that help shape that entrepreneurial spirit then that, that you have so strongly? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I guess the first thing was I saw how I used to be a middle class kid getting presents under the Christmas tree, having new clothes, and also now I'm a kid that has to wear the same exact clothes every single day. My mother had to take a job seven days a week, so she couldn't give me support and any guidance. So I really started asking questions about money early on and, and really realized that if I didn't have money, then I had a lot of problems. But if I did have money, I had less problems. So I associated having money to you know, having pleasure. So that was the beginning yeah. with that. Yeah, and so as, as opposed to a kid who's always in the middle class, they may not associate you know, uh, a, a real deep uh, connection to money and the ability to have great experiences. I had terrible experiences because we had no money. So the mentor, how, how much of a factor then was that in turning you around for yeah. things? 
A hundred percent. That's why I'm so passionate about giving back to youth. I, um, I donate all the proceeds from my book to charity and specifically at-risk youth like Big Brother, Big Sister Charities, Juvenile de Detention Charities. Um, and the reason why is because I w every child is one mentor away from being a success or one negative mentor away from being a total failure. And so that's why I'm so passionate about helping at-risk youth and also single mothers because my mentor changed my life. Was there a defining moment though for you when you, in the darker part of your life that, that you knew you had to change or was this a gradual kind of process yeah. that you'd... Yeah, I, I knew I had to change. There was one defining moment in that um, a number of the kids that I was hanging around with all went to prison uh, for life sentences. That would be a defining yeah. moment. Yeah, it, it was cumulative though, to your question. You know, change happens through a, you know, a number of, of, of messages, so to speak, or moments that occur. There's a number of them, but the ones that were really the most impactful were when I had a mentor and I saw that I had one opportunity. Maybe this was the only opportunity I ever got in my, my life to get out of the poverty that I was living in. And I wasn't gonna uh, you know, pass on that opportunity. So I took, I took my shot. A lot of people, you know, they have opportunity, they just don't take their shot. Well, you hustle and action is yeah. a common theme throughout the book. And there's a story that you tell that you were being paid a dollar to pull weeds yeah. in the yard for, yeah. for to bag. And yeah. you recruited the neighborhood yeah. kids, paid them 50 cents, yeah. and then you pocketed the difference. That kind of spirit, is yeah. that in your personality or is that learned behavior for somebody? Uh, you know, I think it's learned behavior, but um, I, I did have some gifts that I've been able to leverage. Uh, but I think we all have gifts, and the key is to find your gifts that you want to leverage. So, like, for example, I have a lot of disadvantages that I had to turn into advantages. A lot of people would say, Ryan, you're so ADD. Well, that turns out, you know, pretty well if you're uh, giving speeches and you're trying to entertain an audience for quite some time. You're taking them on a journey, right, as opposed to being some boring speaker who... Uh, yeah. So there's a lot I of I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah. That's true. That, that well, could be turned. Uh, your disadvantages can be turned into your advantages, but you have to really assess your skills. You have to understand, you know, where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, and then work on your, uh, your strengths and work, actually work on your weaknesses, but work the hardest on your strengths. You have faced some really profound adverse circumstances, yeah. both personally and professionally. You didn't quit. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, I think the greater, I have a, a faith, uh, so I'm a spiritual person. I believe that I was delivered, uh, you know, the adversity for a reason, that I'm supposed to do something with it, overcome it. You know, I've, I've had adversity even as recently with my son being diagnosed with autism. Uh, my mom uh, was in a coma for 18 months, just recently got out of it. Uh, and I, I believe that I went through these experiences and suffered these adversities because I'm supposed to strengthen from it and also be a model for people also going through similar adversities. Talk a little bit about the parallels that you see the life you led as a gang member with the businessmen that you are now. In the book you mentioned that a little bit. Yeah, there's, there's one expression that's interesting uh, that in my book uh, that I referenced when I was in juvenile hall and you get tested <clears throat> in juvenile hall, people will attempt to steal your milk, you know, they'll bully you. And so I remember being a, you know, a minority in the juvenile hall system of Los Angeles, California, and the first thing the kids would do was try to bully me. And I realized if I allowed myself to be bullied, then I would always be bullied. Uh, so I had to stand up for myself. In business, there's a lot of parallels to that. People will try to bully you. People will try to steal from you. Uh, people will try to manipulate you. So you have to be willing to stand up for yourself and stand up for your values, stand up for what's right. So there's a lot of parallels, a lot of parallels I learned. What was your main motivation in starting uh, the company Vaisalus? Um, well, so Vaisalus was fascinating to me because at the same time that my two co-founders, uh, Nick Sarnicola and Blake Mellon, came to me to start Vaisalus, I had uh, begun a journey of health myself. I was about 260 pounds at the time. I was suffering from lower back pains as a result of the weight that I was carrying. So I knew I had to make some changes in my health, and they had brought me a doctor's patents, and they had brought me a system that I really I believed in, and I... I got, I got the benefits of the products immediately, and so I realized if I'm a person that you know, needs a simple solution to take advantage of their health, that's affordable. There's gotta be more people out there looking for the same solutions. So that wasn't, that's a testimony then for, yeah. for things. And this wasn't your first company, though. No, it was my, um, that I'd started two companies prior to Vaisalus, actually three companies prior to Vaisalus, uh, but Vaisalus I saw as a real lifestyle company that I could really get myself behind, because not only do, do we 
uh, you know, make health-related products, but we also, and, and teach healthy lifestyle for that matter, but we also have entrepreneurs that actually promote our products. So I, got the, I had the ability to live a healthy lifestyle and then to promote a subject I'm really passionate about, which is entrepreneurship. What's the best part then about owning the business? It sounds like you, know, you believe in the product, but you're also in the, the business part and, and still with people. Yeah, the best part about the business is it's a total lifestyle. Um, and a lot of people, we try to categorize our, our time. We say, I'm going to allocate this amount of time toward business, this amount of time toward family, this amount of time toward uh, you know, personal time, leisure, vacation, this amount of time toward sleep. And we, we tend to look at our lives in all these little buckets. I get to, as a result of being a leader of Vicellus, see no differentiation in my time whatsoever because I get to spend time with my family through the Vicellus community. I get to spend time working on my health. I get to spend time mentoring. I mean, you know, the only thing that I don't get to spend time doing is sleeping. I was going to say, it sounds <laughs> yeah. like you're very active, yeah. so I don't think the sleep angle yeah, would be. <laughs> not a lot, yeah, there's not a lot of sleep, but, uh, but our products uh, help us get through that. What do you say to kids um, that are growing up today, as you did, how do you get them to know they need some support, yeah. suggest that they need a mentor, yeah. and, and then how to find a mentor? Yeah, so number one is self-education self and self-development is the most important thing that any of us can do. I'm still a student to this day. I read more than ever. I surround myself with people. I seek out people that are potential mentors for me. And sometimes I'll ask somebody for assistance or I'll want to make a connection and they won't have the time or the interest or there's just not a fit. So it's a process that you have to learn how to do. But in this day and age with Facebook and Twitter and blogs and you know the, the way the world is, you can get a hold of people more so than ever. You know, so if there's somebody that you want to be your mentor, read their book, you know, follow them on Twitter, follow them on Facebook. And then ultimately, you have to figure out a way that you're going to contribute value to their lives. So a lot of people will write in to me, you know, my book has been published everywhere from Korea to Romania to, you know, all around the world. People write me all the time asking me for advice or, you know, giving me, um, asking me to mentor them. And I'm not able, uh, always able to give them the type of support that they need because I'm not the best fit. So, you know, they have to keep trying. It's a numbers game, right? You have to find the right fit. How has social media then changed the way you're doing this outreach? Yeah, so I mean, uh, right now I have a significant following on my Facebook fan page. Uh, we utilize Twitter, Instagram. My company is one of the number one brands uh, in social media in our category. So social, social media is a big investment for us and it, it allows us to have more relationships and more engagement and more friends out there than ever before. On the flip side, if I wanted to be a mentor, how, how do I go about outreach what 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 would you suggest yeah so i you know one of the, the things that i'm a huge believer of is the more that you give the more that you receive so i actually reach out and i give my time to big brother big sister boys and girls club uh, different juvenile detention centers and i just get out there in the community roll up my sleeves and participate you know i'm a huge donor uh, to a number of different charities and then through my business vicellus we also give back a lot we've raised two million meals for uh, kids, hungry kids that are in need. And we just launched a program called Project 10 Kids that are helping, uh, that's helping kids overcome childhood obesity as well. So there's a lot of ways that you can do it. I make, that I make giving a, a, a real center point of my life and everything else tends to fall into place when you do that. You talk in the book about the difference between motivational pitches and yeah. a, a real mentor. Yeah. What's that difference and why does that matter so much that you stress that? Well, you know, I, I, I've, uh, I've sought a lot of mentors that were more charlatan than actual true mentors that were more interested in, you know, me paying them. So, for example, if someone asked me to mentor them, I wouldn't ask them for $10,000, right? Uh, I would tell them that they can intern for me, they can, uh, uh, you know, they can do a variety of things that they can add value to me, but I'm, you know, I'm at the level now where I'm not asking you know, to trade time for money. So, uh, but a lot of people, a lot of so-called mentors out there and many of these motivational speakers, they're simply just trying to take people's money. And, and that's why I titled a chapter, Hustlers and Charlatans and Tony Robbins, in my book. Now, I'm actually a big fan of Tony Robbins, so I don't see him as, as such a person. But there's a lot of people out there that are, you know, the latter. And you explain that it throughout yeah. your book. Yeah. You talk about the proceeds of your book going to um, charities. Yep. Why did you write this book? You know, I, I wrote the book because I was a product of a single mother who got me a mentor. And, you know, as I said, I'm spiritual, so I felt like I was indebted uh, because I did get lucky. I, you know, I did take my shot, but I got lucky. 
So I thought to myself, well, how could I leverage the luck that I've got to give that same type of opportunity to so many? And so we've made an impact in millions of people as a result of, you know, one single mother finding me a mentor. So my hope is to inspire, you know, a generation of young entrepreneurs and a generation of single mothers to do the same. Now you say your, your stepfather was a, a huge factor for you, but that there have been a series of mentors yeah. along the way. It's yeah. not just one person. No, it's not just one. And it's real easy for people to say, oh, he had a single mentor. I've, uh, because I learned how important mentors were and how important conversely me being a consummate student and, and adding value to the lives of my mentors, I started networking and I started building a large network of people that I get my mentorship from. So, you know, it's, it's really a process and still to this day, you know, I'm one mentor away from learning something new that's important to me. In fact, my co-author of Nothing to Lose, Don Yeager, mentored me about the process of writing a book. He was a seven times uh, seven-time New York Times best-selling author and when I met him for the first time by chance at uh, another gentleman named John Wooden's house I asked him if he'd teach me how to write a book he uh, decided after hearing my story to write one with me and now I too am a New York Times best-selling author it would have never occurred had I not sat there as a student at John Wooden's house and a guy named Don Yeager just happened to show up and, uh, and heard my story. So you had that in the back of your mind yeah. that you were thinking about mulling this over about writing the book. Yeah so, yeah, so clarity in what you want to do in life, what your goals are, what your aspirations are, allows you to see the opportunity when it comes around you. You know, in America, a lot of times people forget we are, we are constantly presented with opportunity all around us, right? So we live in a community, you know, all around us yeah. there's an entrepreneurial venture that is going to be started, that, that needs to be started. So you just have to open up your mind to that by assessing your skills, by developing your strengths, and, and by you know, making the, the decision that you want to become an entrepreneur. I understand that you added a chapter onto yeah. the paperback version. Yeah, I did. What, what did you add and well, why? So when my, my hardcover first came out, um, uh, you know, it wasn't doing great. It, you know, it, it just came out. Uh, and I, my goal was to be a number one New York Times bestselling author, <laughs> right? And so all of a sudden, my Facebook's blowing up, my Twitter's blowing up. Yahoo.com had put me on the cover of the homepage and it said from gang member to CEO and Yahoo.com has millions of people on the homepage. So next thing you know, millions of people are getting exposed to my book, exposed to my story and there's a fair amount of people out there that wanted to make fun. So uh, I, you know, I, 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 I smiled at some of the comments and others of them were just downright hurtful. You know, here I am trying to do my best to succeed and some people are sitting there, you know, tearing that apart. So I wrote a chapter dedicated to them called Told You So. And in that chapter, I discuss the experience of dealing with people that are just, you know, they're, they're just naysayers and, and people that like to project onto you, uh, you know, their negative belief systems or their lack of belief in themselves. Well, I think, I don't know whether it was in the book or another article that I read, that you have a playlist for yeah. haters. Yeah, oh, I do. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a contributor to Forbes. And, you know, uh, uh, told you so is the, the mantra that every, uh, my company by Salas gives out BMWs uh, to people who qualify at a certain sales rank. And so we uh, ship every one of those BMWs with a license plate, plate bracket that says told you so. Um, and I have a playlist for them that, uh, that is uh, filled with a lot of hip hop, but it's a real dedication toward overcoming those people that are trying to hold you back in life. Now you encourage people to read as many books as possible. What's the reasoning behind that? Was that help, that was helpful for you? Yeah, um, you know, I, I believe that books are one of the most important things and self-development is really the most important. So if you're able to uh, listen to audio series, I read blogs, you know, I read the news feeds, I read inspirational sources all day long. And when I do, and every once in a while, I do you know, have a tough time or I go through a, a dry spell or you know, something's happening in my family life that you know, is, is taking a lot out of me, I turn to sources of, of reading, of education, of inspiration. You know, that's the way that we continue to grow and, and you know, get beyond our present circumstances. And even in the stage that I'm in now, I have to constantly do that. Oh, it's a, a learning process all the, like, all the time. Yeah, John Wooden sat there and asked me more questions than I asked him. And he was 99 years old. And here's a man who had received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, 10 NCAA national champions, sold more books than I ever will, and he's asking me questions and learning from me at 99 years old. You talk about Jay-Z, Russell yeah. Simmons, um, yeah. Donald Trump, and you refer to them as rock star businessmen. Yeah. What do you mean by that, and do you admire them? Yeah, oh, I very much admire all, all the, the people that you reference there. In fact, I quote, uh, Jay-Z gave me a quote where he said, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business comma man. I'm sorry, I'm not a business man, I'm a business comma man. And in that quote, it meant that, you know, he's not a businessman, he's a brand. And I wrote an article on my Forbes.com blog about that subject. And, you know, part of my writing of the book was inspired by, 
you know, Jay-Z and a number of others that have taken their brand uh, to the next level. Our economy is, is improving yeah. slowly, but I think people are still pretty cautious and scared. What advice would you have for somebody that's thinking about a startup company? Yeah, you know, the, the difference between, the reason why I'm successful is because I had this, this idea and this mindset that I had nothing to lose when I started my businesses. I knew I'd never go back to absolute poverty, dodging drive-bys and getting arrested and having to worry about my safety because I'd gotten some success behind me and I'd been trained and had some good jobs, it paid okay. So that said, a lot of people are fearful of losing their middle class environment or losing the little savings that they have so they never take the risk. You have to measure your own risk and reward. For me, I just needed to have six months to live on and then I could, you know, I knew I could get another job or figure out what I was gonna do next. So you have to assess your risk and you have to then act like you have nothing to lose. Once you have your kind of, you know, your risk cushion, saved away, you have to make some brave uh, decisions and maybe get to outside your comfort zone and take some risks. Well, and you say in the book, it's a risk that's not foolhardy. Yeah. It's, it's a calculated risk yeah. and a very thoughtful thing, but you still have to have yeah. that courage to do well, it. Well, so once you take the risk, you have to reverse engineer the probability of success. You have to spend the time doing it, right? So I took a risk in writing a book about my gang life, right? That was a huge risk because, you know, I, I didn't have, uh, I was a juvenile. Uh, it was a, a sealed record that had been expunged. I didn't have to talk about uh, my juvenile Takes courage to do that. Yeah. yeah, it was a huge risk, but I realized that there was a probability of reward, provided that I could get out there, mentor, and give back, and, and you know, and be a beacon of hope for those people that have had nothing to lose moments in their life. So that that risk has paid off, but I didn't do it uh, without having analyzed every potential and every probable uh, uh, outcome of it, and then making the investments to get it out there and, and get, make the story a success. I read your book and yeah. I've watched a number of interviews. It seems like money is a means to an end for you, yeah. not all consuming, important. Yeah. Is, is that true? And yeah. do you think that's a hallmark for your generation? Yeah, you know, money is keeping score, right? So if I were Kobe Bryant, uh, you know, he doesn't play for money anymore, right? He wasn't so upset at ruining his Achilles tendon uh, be, the other night because it was gonna cost him money. Uh, it's, he's keeping score. So. The sport of entrepreneurship is scored by money. It's scored by the amount of contribution that you make. It's scored by the revenue of your company. It's scored by the number of jobs. There's a number of scoring uh, factors within it. Money is only one of them. Uh, but I've pledged to give away my money at the end of my days. You know, I'll, I'll give my son the best education uh, that, that he can earn, uh, but I'm not gonna leave him with a curse of you know, a significant amount of money because I believe that is a curse. So I, I, I see myself leaving my money to charities that you know they're they're connected to causes that I'm very passionate about. Well, your Blair Foundation that was one of the stipulations you put yep. in. You want it wound down within ten years of your death. Yeah, so I'm not doing this to put my name on the walls. Uh, uh, after my uh, passing, uh, my foundation will have given out all the money uh, within ten years, and hopefully that'll be a significant amount. But I also do plan to spend a whole lot of it in my <laughs> lifetime and enjoy it as well. Ryan, what's your top piece of advice for our viewers? Uh, you know, the, for those viewers out there that have the capability to mentor, reach out. There's a big brother, a big sister program near you. And not only are you doing it for the kids, but it also helps you. I mean, it, it's, there's nothing like getting that feedback and being able to contribute. For those people that need some help, you know, buy a book, uh, start educating yourself, create a personal education plan. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing yeah, your story. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've been talking with entrepreneur Ryan Blair, the author of Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain, about overcoming adversity and becoming a self-made millionaire. Thank you for tuning in to Metro Center Outlook. Until next time, I'm Diane Trees.